Well, if you're new with us, we're studying the book of Ecclesiastes, just going verse by verse through it. We've come to chapter 10. Actually, we're about to finish the book. Chapter 11 is very short. Chapter 12 is very short. And King Solomon, who the scripture says was the wisest man that ever lived, he is absolutely brilliant. You could say, as we've been reading the book, though, he's a brilliant bonehead. Because even though he's brilliant, he admits and he confesses, and I, I at least give him credit for that. I, I, I at least, uh-oh. That's not good. That's going to keep doing it, isn't it? At least he wrote this book to help us, to help us not follow in the foolishness that he did. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking, you know, well, if, if, if he was so smart, why would he make so many mistakes? We trust in man's intellect. Well, sometimes we say, if this person is so intelligent, how could they vote for that? How could they be a part of that? How could they believe that? And the mistake we make is we think that they're doing those things by their intelligence, but they're not. The problem isn't their IQ. The problem, as the Bible is clear, is they are morally sick. But when you are morally sick, it will affect your thinking. And so that's what we got to keep in mind as Solomon is talking about uh, worldly wisdom and foolishness, okay? So let's get into this. And, and basically what he does, like the book of Proverbs, he just gives all these Proverbs to us to help us get the wisdom from it, godly wisdom. Verse 1, and I'm trying not to move. Verse 1 says, Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. Oh, in ancient times, uh, we talked about it, how these perfumes, these ointments that these ancient people would have, they didn't have showers, they didn't have baths, and so they would oil themselves. Hmm. Time out. How's this? You hear me? Am I so honest? Uh, you hear me? This must be some good stuff. This must be some good stuff that I'm talking about, okay? So these ancients love these ointments, these perfumes, but if they bought one at the marketplace that had a couple dead flies in it, they got ripped off because the dead flies would give off a stench. You know how that is. If you have a big bowl of soup and you are hungry and it looks so good, one little fly is going to ruin that soup, isn't it? And that's what he's saying here. The last thing he said, you remember in chapter 9, he said, one sinner destroys much good. And he's giving us wisdom here that we don't realize that one bad act, one big mistake can ruin your life. As Christians, it can ruin your testimony. You know, when unbelievers make a big mistake in their life, I think it's good. Because sometimes they'll make such a big mistake, it's hard to recover from without God's grace, without God's forgiveness, without God's help. So it brings them to their knees. But to us that are believers, we've got to be careful because, you know, especially pastors, one bad thing can ruin your whole reputation, can ruin your whole testimony. So that's what, that's what Solomon is saying here. I, I heard an illustration in I took an evangelism class when I was young, and I heard the illustration about making an omelet. Well, how many rotten eggs ruin the omelet? One. And 
you need to understand if you're here and you're not a Christian, how many sins will keep you out of heaven? Just one. One rotten egg ruins the omelet. You can add as many good eggs as you want and try to cover it up. It's, it's spoiled. It's ruined. And so you as a sinner, once you're born and one, you're bo- you sin, you don't sin because you sin because you're a sinner. So you're born that way. But you need to understand. So therefore, you've got to have your sin cut out. And there's only one surgeon that can cut out sin. And his name is God. His name is Jesus Christ. He died for your sin. And so that's the only way for it to be forgiven. As far as flies go, I don't know where the flies hang out at your house, but they hang out at my garbage can. So you want to stay away from flies? Stay away from the garbage of this world. Turn off the news and read your Bible. Turn off that internet and read your Bible. Verses 2 and 3 says, A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Can't believe Solomon's getting political on us now, right? (laughs) Verse 3, Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone that he is a fool. Some people... It's almost like they're proud of their foolishness. You can see them coming. You can tell by the way they're walking. They don't even have to open their mouth. You can tell by what they're wearing. And sometimes a fool is pretty evident. But sometimes you don't, the fool doesn't seem so foolish at first until you hear him talk. And The sad thing about being a fool that God's talking about, that Scripture's talking about, that's morally sick, if you're a fool here today, here's the bad news. You don't even know you're a fool. Why is that? Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. A fool thinks he's right. A fool thinks he knows more than God. He's not going to listen to advice. There are people who come to church and they hear the word of God. And what they do is they take home the parts they like. They take home the parts that I agreed with their logic. And they spit out the truth that they don't want. This is sad. You, the, you can't be a Christian. You can't say you believe in Christ, but then, but then make Christ, make Jesus into who you want him to be. It doesn't work that way. You must surrender, and I keep saying this, you must surrender. And it's the only way not to be a fool, because you might be saying, well, Frank, who are you? Why are you an expert uh, on who a fool is? Well, I'm going by what God says. I'm not going by what Frank says. Psalm 14.1 says, A fool says in his heart, there is no God. So God's calling people a fool who live like there is no God. And and I don't think that's just talking about atheists. I think that's talking about people who say there's no God in their heart by the way they act, by the way they talk, by the way they think. And so the only way, you know, Jesus said... Jesus tells the parable how he's going to put... The Bible says a lot about the right. You want to be on the right, okay? Because Jesus said he's going to put the goats on his left and the sheep on his right. Unbelievers are going to be left. They're going to be left out of the kingdom. They're going to be left out of heaven. And they're going to spend eternity in hell. But the people on the right, the sheep, You know, goats are stubborn, man. Goats are stubborn. And I think that's why he uses the analogy of a goat. Goats are always butting things, you know. Uh, I like to read the Bible, but, you know. But sheep, sheep, they, 
They hear the shepherd's voice. voice. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They take the advice. They surrender. And they follow me. Verse 4. My neck's going to be sore for this microphone. I'm trying to stay stiff, you know. That's all right. It'll humble me. Ecclesiastes 10.4. Solomon, continuing on, says, If the anger of a ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. If you have wisdom, stay calm. Don't overreact all the time. Solomon says, let God's spirit, God's word, give you a calmness. Proverbs says, a wise man holds his tongue, but a fool shows his annoyance at once. I mean, you could be having a conversation with someone, and it's going so good, and they're doing all the talking, right? And then all of a sudden, you say one thing to kind of correct them, to kind of give them some truth. And man, they come unglued on you. A fool shows his annoyance at once. Stay calm. Stay calm. Let God fight for you. Let God fight before you start fighting and get yourself into trouble. Verse 5, he continues on with wisdom. He says, There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an heir proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. What is he saying there? I think he's, what he's saying, he's saying be a person of character. He's saying, you know, I've seen princes on horses, and I've seen slaves walking, but the slave was the one with the character, not the prince. I've been to prisons. I've been to jails. I've seen inmates come to Jesus Christ, and really, and, and, and it becomes real. And, and now that inmate becomes a person of character. Yet they're still in prison today. But the people in charge of the prison are evil. And they have no character, good character. And I think that's what Solomon's saying. There is coming a day when that's all going to be changed. Okay? And, you know, you think about... You think about Moses. Moses, the scripture says, he left Egypt. He left the pleasures of Egypt. He'd rather suffer with the people of God. He went out there tending sheep. Pharaoh, though, stayed in Egypt. And Pharaoh had all the power and all the money and all the wealth and was dressed in his fancy Pharaoh outfit. And Moses came to Pharaoh and and spoke the word of God to him. And he arrogantly would not listen. Who was the leader? Who was the better leader? The sheep herder? Or the Pharaoh dressed in his pomp? It was Moses. Jesus Christ. They brought our Savior Jesus Christ before Pilate in chains. And Pilate mocked him. So you're a king? You're a king and what is truth? He had no idea. He had truth standing right in front of him. And here was the king of kings in chains. Who was the person of character? Be a person of character. Wherever you're at, whatever your position, you might be in a low position at your job and somebody could be above you. Be a person of character to God. That is true wisdom. He continues on, verses 8 and 9. says, He who digs a pit will fall into it and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them. And he who splits logs is endangered by them. Now that, that he who digs a pit will fall into it, that's many times in Scripture, that's poetic justice. Um, you know, Jesus said, a blind man will need another blind man into a pit 
talking about spiritual blindness. And I think what he's getting at here is he's getting like people have these plans for themselves. They leave God out, and it comes back to haunt them. It comes back to bite them, literally, like he says, they're breaking through a wall, and all of a sudden they get bit by a poisonous serpent. And the idea is you don't have, you don't have knowledge of what is around the corner. You don't know how fast something can happen. And you've got all these plans, and you leave God out. And I think it's, he has in mind, you know, James, James said, you say you're going to go to this city and do business there. And James says, your life is just but a mist. You better say, if God will, I'm going to go to the city and do this or that. And the idea behind that is we make all these plans and we have no idea what's around the corner. And we need the wisdom of God. We need to humble ourselves before God and know this. We never know. I've been meaning to tell you all this. I was going to tell you before vacation. Some of you know, if you're friends with my wife on Facebook, but I opened my sliding door uh, to let my dogs out, and I had a rattlesnake on my porch. I had a, he was a, you know, he's one of those eastern diamondback rattlers, fat. That rattle was loud. He wasn't a real long one. He was about three or four foot, but he had some poison. And I mean, here I am just letting the dogs out on a normal day, and I got a stinking rattlesnake on my porch. My dog was right in his face, right in his face. And I screamed his name, Riker, and he usually never comes when he's chasing wildlife. But I screamed so loud that he came because I heard the rattle. And he came to me, thank God. God had mercy on us, had mercy on me and mercy on my dog. But we just never know, do we? We never know. So don't make these plans apart from God. Verse 10. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge... He must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. <laughs> so first he says, you know, you need, to, you need to sharpen that axe. If you're a fool and you don't sharpen your axe, you're going to go out there and beat up the trees, beat up yourself. I remember when I was a kid, I remember my dad saying, hey, let the saw do the work. Because you're trying to muscle that thing and it ain't working. You let the saw do the work. That's what he's getting at here. <laughs> and then he says, you know, this guy gets this idea. I'm going to be a snake charmer. I'm going to make some money. I'm going to go buy one of these snakes at the marketplace. And I'll become a snake charmer and make me all kinds of cash. Well, it don't help when the snake bites you and you die, right? So the point is, you better have wisdom. You better have wisdom before you set out to do anything. And of course, spiritual wisdom is more important than anything. You know, we're here today sharpening our minds with God's wisdom so we can approach life better, so we can make wise decisions, so we don't go by our earthly wisdom and follow the rest of the world. So we need to be sharpened by God through the power of His Spirit, through the power of His Word. Spiritual wisdom is so important. And uh, I couldn't help but think about the snake charmers getting bit, you know. They, you, I don't know, you Google it. They get bit all the time and die, even in our modern world. These, these religious cults, these guys twirling around rattlesnakes. And they think they're right. They think they're the one true church, you know, twirling around rattlesnakes. You know how many of these people die from that? They got kids die. They sh that, that should be outlawed. <laughs> Crazy stuff should be outlawed, you know? But we will see. We'll see. Solomon talks about why crazy laws are allowed here in a little bit. But people think they're right. And there's so much out there. 
There's so much political garbage out there that people fall for and it becomes a religion to them. And there's so much religious garbage out there and people fall for it. Uh, Friday, I was walking my dogs and these kids came up on, on a bike. Nice kids, good looking kids. And they said, you wanna, do you want to know Jesus? <laughs> and I was like, I, you know, first I thought, this is cool, man. These kids are going around passing out their church cards. I was like, yeah, I want to know Jesus. I said, I already know Jesus. I actually said, I'm a pastor at Freedom Bible Church. Where do you go to church? We don't go to church. Oh, you don't? No, we, our people watch something on the Internet at 10 p.m. And here's our card. You could watch it on the Internet. So now then I looked at the card, and it says they only use the King James Bible. Let me tell you something. Anybody that says they only use the King James Bible is either misguided or they are a cult. Trust me on this, and you will, you will see it. So anyway, I didn't get a chance to research it. I tried to Google it. It's called Bible Study 101. Well, when you Google that, so much of that comes up, I couldn't even find their, their site. I guess I have to watch it at 10 o'clock because I do want to research it because I'm going to be running into these kids. Because I ran, then yesterday, yesterday, I went back to the same spot. Another kid came up. I kind of have a feeling that they sent this kid because they were with the other kids. Because this kid said a little bit more. He came up and said, you want to know Jesus? And I said, well, your buddies uh, just gave, gave me a card yesterday. And he's like, we have Jesus. We don't sin. I mean, of all the things you can say to me, he arrogantly says to me, we have Jesus and we don't sin. I was like, you don't sin? I said, well, guess what? You just sin by saying that because you do sin. And I said, first, John clearly says, if you claim to have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. And I said, buddy, I think you're involved in a cult. I gave him his card back. And he waddled away, waddle, waddle, waddle. He waddled away. And you, it's like you might say, well, Frank, why are you being so harsh to a young kid? Because I want to I put the seed in his mind that you better, you better think about what you're involved in and what your parents got you involved in passing out these cards. And I guarantee you, I already know. I already know God has given me enough spiritual discernment you can talk to some people for five minutes and i guarantee you if i watch that show at 10 there's all kinds of false stuff they're saying but people think they're right and they're passing out cards and they know you, you want to know what's sad why are all the cults passing out cards why are all the cults going door to door where are the people of god with the real truth Inviting people to hear the real truth of Jesus Christ. Let's continue on. Verse 12. This is good. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. A man who speaks wise words from his mouth is going to be respected. People are going to want to follow that leader, follow that man if the right words come out of his mouth because as Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So somebody with true character, you know it by what they say. But a foolish person, it's just going to get them in constant trouble. Verse 13, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. Soon as he opens it up, here it comes. It's foolishness. And the end of his talk is evil madness. He gets started and it's foolish, and by the end, it's, it's, it's absolute craziness. Verse 14, but he keeps on talking. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what it is to be. And who can tell him what will be after him? In other words, he's just talking so much, you can't even talk to the guy or girl. Because they're just, and understand, it's, it's what's in the heart. It's what's in the heart. It's a heart problem. It's not an IQ problem. 
It is a moral heart problem. Proverbs says so much about our words. Jesus, Jesus said about our words. He says, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what comes out of your mouth shows what's in your heart. Verse 15. The toil of the fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. <laughs> in other words, a fool, he's probably tired from talking. He's too tired from talking to get to the city. He's too tired from whatever he's doing in his life to go to work, is what it's saying. He's all messed up in his selfishness and his foolishness that he can't get to the city and go to work. And so Solomon says, don't be like that. Don't, don't get yourself so engulfed in selfishness and the things of this world because it'll shackle you. You won't even be able to get out of bed. You, you won't be able to do what God has called you to do. You won't be able to get where you need to go that God has called you to go because you're so engulfed in foolishness. Verse 16. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Woe to your country when your king acts like a child. Is he what? Solomon got a crystal ball or something, or is he just, maybe his words are inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And basically what he's saying is, you got this childish king, and the princes are feasting in the morning. In other words, they're partying in the morning. They're not getting any work for the kingdom done. They're not, they're not helping the people because it's all about themselves. Verse 17, but happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. In other words, happy is your country when your king is noble and, and, and the people that work in your government eats to be strong, not to get drunk. They really care about the people. Verse 18, continuing on with this, through sloth, the roof sinks in. Through indolence, the house leaks. In other words, if you don't put the work in, if you don't work with wisdom, not only is it going to ruin your country, but it'll ruin your life. It'll ruin your own house if you don't have the wisdom to take care of matters. And obviously, it sounds like he's talking f physical, and that's true, but he's talking about spiritual leaks. Things that we don't take care of. And then this will be our attitude. He's sarcastic. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. So in other words, going with this whole, you got this childish king and they're partying away in the morning and the country's being ruined and the people are all caught up in it and the roof is leaking, the house is falling apart, but they're saying, let's go to lunch tomorrow. Where are we going to lunch tomorrow? Let's have a glass of wine, cheer up, because money answers everything as long as we got money in the bank we're gonna be good right or we'll just print some more money right and it all comes crashing down verse 20 even in your thoughts do not curse the king nor in your bedroom curse the rich for a bird of the air will carry your voice or some winged creature tell the matter. There's where I got my title. Started off with dead flies. Now he's talking about winged creatures. In these ancient times, if they got wind of you talking about the king, they would come and get you and 
off would be your head, right? And so what he's saying is you better be careful what you say because you're in secret and you think nobody's going to share what you shared about the king. But a little birdie, a little birdie will fly and tell him some winged creature pick up that information and the king will hear about it. And I think, I think what he's saying here Talking about words again, how our words, foolish words, get us into trouble. Jesus said men will give an account for every careless word they have spoken. Jesus said what you tell people in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. That, that's, that's hyperbole, but Jesus is saying, he said this in Luke's gospel, what you say in secret, God is going to expose on Judgment Day. So we better watch what we say. And, and you know, the ultimate king, the ultimate king, we're going to have to give an account, see? And the ultimate king, there, we can't hide anything from him. That's the point. So watch what you say. The Bible talks a lot about false Christians, people who think they're Christians, but they're not Christians. It's kind of scary stuff. Jesus talked about it a lot. And so I would say to you, if I would say to you this morning, if, if you have some doubt whether or not you're a true Christian or not, one of the ways you can tell is how you talk. You see, because if you have come to Jesus Christ and if the Holy Spirit lives in you, there is no way you are going to talk the same. You're going to talk different. You're not going to say words that you used to say anymore. Things that come out of your mouth are going to praise God and the things of God. There's no way you're going to be cursing the things of God and cursing God's church and going against clearly what Scripture says for, for your own, following your own wisdom, your own selfishness. So this is a serious, serious matter. Watch what you say. And... Hey, you can clean up your language on the outside sometimes and never really clean up the heart. You'll just exchange it with something else. Watch what you say. And the way to do that is if your heart changes, it'll automatically happen. If you read the Bible and quit putting garbage into your mind, when you put garbage in your mind, garbage is going to come out of your mouth and it's going to affect your heart. But if you put wisdom into your mind, if you put God's power into your mind, and, and it gets it within your heart, it's going to change the way you talk. And you'll be a person of character like he's talking about. Here's the good news. Here's the gospel good news. You could walk in here. You could be a visitor and you, you could feel like I'm talking right to you. You could, feel like, you could feel like, man, I've been foolish in every little way you talked about. Welcome to the club. Because as I told that, that young boy, if we claim to be without sin, we lie. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to purify us. Even though we sin and we know we sin, we come to Christ and Christ will purify you. You say, how do I? I want wisdom. How do I know if what I'm following, what I'm reading, how do I know what's right and what's wrong? How do I know what's the world's foolishness versus God's wisdom? Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. 
if you begin to fear God, if you begin to respect God more than anything else, wisdom has begun in you. And it will continue to grow. And it doesn't mean you're going to know how to do geometry. I think if you're a student uh, studying geometry, I think if you pray to God, he'll help you. Yeah. But the point is, you're going to have spiritual wisdom. You're going to have the answers to life and the answers to eternal life. That are, that's way more important than anything they're pushing out there, folks. Fear God. Respect God. That's the beginning of wisdom. Receive God's mercy. You know that rattlesnake, <laughs> that rattlesnake on my porch, thought came to my mind, well, he's got to die. But I don't know, for some reason, I'm getting soft in my old age. For some reason, I let him live. Because I started thinking, you know what? It ain't his fault. I'm the one that has a crack in my doggy door that I was late, too lazy to fix. That's how he came in and got stuck in there. He had mercy on my dog. He didn't bite my dog. That made me want to have mercy on him. That rattlesnake got full of poison. Full of poison. But somebody decided to have mercy on him. <laughs> when you're born into this world, you are full of poisonous sin. And God chooses to have mercy on you. <laughs> I got a vacuum cleaner box out of the garage. My wife got a new vacuum. So I pushed the box <laughs> up to the snake and then turned the box up upright. And I don't even know how smart this is. I could hear him rattling in there. I figured he's not going to get up the box, and he stayed down there hiding. Then I put him in the back seat of my car and took him out far in the woods, away from houses, okay? Just a little. Bit. You know, they're fat. Those, those diamondbacks are fat, and they got a big rattle. And he was rattling the whole time I was driving. My son-in-law, Michael, said, man, if you would have put that on TikTok, it would have went viral. I don't even know what TikTok is, and I wouldn't even know how to get it on there. He's like, if that was on TikTok, those kids, everybody would have watched that and like, look at this old fool with a rattlesnake in his back seat. Some of you say, well, that's grace, man. That's grace. No, that's not grace. That's mercy. Grace would have been, you know what grace is? Grace would have been I let him in the house and let him live with me. Let him live in the house. Let me love him. Let me feed him. That's grace. Mercy is God doesn't punish you and send you to hell for your sins. Over you. You're full of poison and you deserve it. He came and he died on the cross. And his mercies are new every day. And if you receive him, that'll be the beginning of wisdom. But not only does God give you mercy, he gives you grace. He lets you in his house. And he's going to spoil you for all of eternity. Anybody that chooses that chooses wisdom. Anyone who rejects that is the ultimate fool. Pray with me this morning. Pray with me. Pray to God. I don't care what that young man said or what their church teaches I'm going to tell you the truth right now you have sinned and you will always sin in this human body and if you don't realize that this is why people can't don't come to Christ because they don't see themselves as a depraved sinner they see themselves as better than others you have to see that you have sinned against God. One rotten egg ruins the omelet. One fly ruins the whole thing. One sin in your life. And I want to tell you something. you got millions of them. You have sins you're not even aware of. 
because in our, our minds are earthly foolish. We don't even realize when we say something foolish or do something foolish half the time. But Jesus came and loved us in all of our foolishness and all of our sin. He loves you right where you're at. Embrace Christ. Surrender to him. Follow him. Be obedient to him. And every time you open up the Bible, be obedient to it. If it doesn't match with your politics, throw your politics in the trash and follow Christ. If there's something in your life that doesn't glorify God, get it out. Follow Christ. If you're already a Christian, follow Christ. Let it be real. Let him deal with that character so we can be witnesses for others. So our words will be respected. So people will be attracted to the truth and nothing but the truth. Father, I pray for these dear people. I thank them for coming to worship you today. I pray that they were blessed. God, our songs were so good today worshiping you, giving glory to your cross. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. God, we don't realize, I don't even think we can fully understand how merciful you are, how gracious you are. But God, help us now as we close to sing, to truly be happy in our hearts, to worship you, to surrender whatever we, need to need, whatever we need to surrender, to put you first. Lord Jesus, may we throw away all our false gods and put you at the top of our list in everything we say and do. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.